Hey, hey, everyone. Good morning. I'm Katie McGregor Bennett. This is Design Uncut, home tech top 10 products designers need to know about. I'm joined today by a fabulous group of integrators who some of you may know, some of you may not, but after today's session, you certainly will. We're going to be talking about technology for the design community, but we're also going to be talking about ways that it, the integration community can be presenting these products to designers in a way that the designers can better present them and turn to their clientele. So this is really a conversation that meets in the middle of design and technology. I'm joined today by my fabulous co-host of Design Uncut, Veronica Miller, of Modena's Media. Veronica, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for the intro. This is a great bunch, and thanks for getting up so super early over there in Mountain Time. Absolutely. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> so we should, before we launch into this, we should talk a little bit, just very briefly, about how we met. How did we meet? I forget. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the, the, the real story is, is that we actually met at Cedia Expo back in the days when we had these events and they were live. Um, and the design community was invited to come and tour the show floor. We've done this now for two years in the past and both times, Jamie Breeze, Meister of Integration uh, Controls in St. Louis and Peter Cook, uh, of also an integrator in the community. Um, Joe Whitaker has also helped tour these designers around. Veronica, you were one of them. Um, truth be told, I stalked you for a little while because I, I, I saw you online. I saw so you online. <laughs> you know, but you know, as you do, you kind of, you, you, you find about people and then you want to go and learn more about, um, but I bumped into you at KBiz, uh, the, uh, the show at the beginning of the year. And lo and behold, if you weren't back at Cedia last September, we had an opportunity to catch up there a little bit. And honestly, I think that's where the seed was set for what would follow, um, which is design on cut. And you, so you were, and you were stalking us, you know, if you remember you're, we have a group on Facebook that is owned by my company, Medina's media, which is the kitchen and bath industry group. It's a private group. It's for everybody in the industry. It's obviously there's lots of interior designers, there's kitchen bath designers. And frankly, there are also a lot of integrator and tech folks in the mix right now that sort of organically developed. And I love that it did. And uh, Katie was just kind of lurking in the shadows all the time. So, you know, we kind of said, okay, maybe we should talk, stop lurking, get out here. And let's talk about how can we effectively mesh the two in a way that that works. And, and Design Uncut has its name because it's, it's unabridged, it's raw. It's a conversation about how can we connect designers and tech folks in a way that makes their projects better to where we're not enemies and not frenemies to where we can just be friends and have a common goal. So that's kind of where, we, where, where we're taking this. Yeah, yeah. And you know, what's interesting about it is the, the genesis of this was, was the, these conversations about connecting the technology and design integration communities. And, and honestly, it took a pandemic to kind of make it happen. And I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm proud of that, you know? Well, it's, I, <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. 
Here we are. Here we are. And we're in our houses. By the way, I have a concrete cutter outside, so don't let any of this bother you. If it gets all shaky here, this is not me having an earthquake. I'm safe and sound on the East Coast. Uh, there's no fires. There's no storms. There's, there's nothing. I'm just here in Lancaster, PA. Uh, I can't believe. I cannot believe you just said that, that none of those things are occurring right now. It's almost as though you've just jinxed yourself. So hold on, sister. See what happens in the next 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's 2020. You shouldn't say that. There are aliens on Venus now. I just thought I'd throw that in too. So um, <laughs> do we want to kick the show off because we don't have Absolutely. much time. They, they did not have a three-hour session. So why don't we let our three panelists introduce themselves, starting ladies first, of course, with Jamie, and then go through the list. Hello, thank you very much, Veronica. Great to see you, Katie. Uh, my name is Jamie Briesmeister, and I am an integrator out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, this year, we'll be celebrating our 16th year in business. And if you choose to follow me anywhere on social, you'll find me at Control STL. And Ed? Yep. Hey, uh, I'm Ed Gilmore. Uh, we're an integrator based in uh, New York City in Manhattan. And uh, we've been uh, doing this for nearly 30 years. I know it sounds crazy, but for me, it sounds crazy, but nearly 30 years in this industry. Um, and uh, we're super excited to be part of this panel and loving the uh, community. And uh, thank you, Katie and Veronica, for including us. Appreciate it. Absolutely. And finally, last but not least, Brad. Hi, I'm Brad Hinsey with Control4. Uh, we offer a wide variety of technology products for uh, smart homes and, and smart businesses. And uh, we're very, we've over the last couple of years spent a lot of time connecting and talking with designers and, and trying to build those relationships. And it's been a really great uh, conversation. And so I'm happy to be here with all of you today. We're happy to have you. And uh, you did not mention that you're also the sponsor of the session, but you should because Control 4 certainly, you guys go out of your way to, to connect with design communities. So, so my people are really appreciative of all the efforts that you make and um, you know, trying to level the playing field and, and get folks uh, to talk with each other and uh, make great stuff happen. So Without further ado, Brad, why don't you take us through a little bit, help people understand this is, you know, this top 10 products talk, but give us a little backstory on Control 4, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. So Control 4, we have been uh, in the market for um, over 15 years now. And um, one of the things that we have seen with technology, um, and I think this is especially true over the last, you know, 10 years, um, we see this tremendous trend where everything is uh, becoming smart and connected and intelligent. And it's a really exciting opportunity for us to leverage the benefits of technology um, within our most important, our most private spaces, right? Our homes are our castle. And, you know, there's no time that, that, that that's been more true than, than now in the last uh, six to nine months where we really truly are living, we're working, we're relaxing, you know, we're educating our children uh, within our, our homes. And technology really can provide us so many benefits for our living space and, and being together as a family. And so having all of these varieties of devices across our home, from comfort systems to refrigerators, uh, to even appliances um, is a really great opportunity. And I think it's, it's really exciting. Um, and everybody's kind of becoming aware of some of those uh, possibilities. But one of the challenges that we see is that not all smart is created equal. Um, everything is getting labeled smart nowadays. Uh, I mean, we're, we see the crazy things like salt and pepper shakers that are smart and connected. And it's like, what in the world are you going to do with the smart and connected salt and pepper shaker? Uh, and so that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of noise. Um, I think particularly for those that are in the channel, uh, but also in the design community, when you have a customer coming to you and say, hey, I'm interested in this technology. Can you guide me? Um, but also on the integration side, you know, those of us that live and breathe uh, this market and making these things a possibility, um, how do we talk about it in a way that helps people appreciate the, what you can do with this technology? How do you um, approach the technology in a way that you can evaluate whether it's a good device or whether it's just garbage, right? So one of the things that we have been talking about over the last couple of years is the need for a smart home 
operating system or an OS. Um, our computers have them, our mobile phones have them, our cars have them too. And you know, these really come out of the need to take all of the individual devices and pieces of technology that make up a computer and just make it simple to use. Make it something that you can rely on and uh, make it so that you really get the benefit out of it. I mean, if you think about your mobile phone and if you had to juggle your GPS with your cellular radio, with your camera, you know, all of those individual components, it wouldn't be very useful. And a mobile OS makes it super easy to use and gives you all of the benefits of all those pieces working together. And so that's what an operating system can do for a home too. And so what we've uh, created is this list of things to look for uh, in terms of what might a smart home OS be or what might it look like. Um, first of all, it unifies everything across the home. Many smart devices are kind of narrowly focused on one category of product, um, but we believe a, a smart home OS has to connect everything from lighting to security to comfort to entertainment, all of that into an easy way to use and, and live with that technology. Second, a smart home OS, of course, is infrastructure, right? Our homes, we rely on them. We're in them every day. We need it to be there and functioning and working all the time. And so um, that's an important aspect of the reliability and having it available. But the other piece of that is it's built into the home. It's not just some piece of technology that we put on the shelf or that we stick on the wall with double stick tape, right? It's, it's built in, it's purposeful, it's deliberate. Um, third, uh, a smart home OS needs to provide the family with choice and simplicity. Um, there is no such thing as a home that's delivered by one manufacturer or one brand. And so the family should be able to choose to bring in their favorite products, the best products in the market. And so a smart home OS embraces and provides that choice, but it needs to also be easy for the entire family to be able to use. Not just the nerd, not just the one that loves technology, everyone, including guests that come to the home. It needs to be easy to use with a variety of interfaces um, so that um, you can use that technology whenever you want it. A fourth, a smart home OS will protect the privacy of the home, uh, of those that live in the home. You know, this, this, these are our most private spaces. And yet with each of these devices, we're generating more and more and more data uh, that big companies can use. And, you know, it gets misused in many other ways. And so um, a smart home OS will protect the privacy of those that live there by default. And then we can choose when and where and how to share data. And lastly, a smart home OS embraces the role of a professional in delivering this kind of technology. Um, families want help. They want to be able to just live in their home. They don't want to be dealing with the technology all of the time. And so a smart home OS has the tools, has the capabilities for professionals to be able to help a family. So one of the things that I think is uh, really important uh, in this conversation is that you know, I think it, it can be assumed or many people assume a smart home is run by your mobile phone and or voice control alone. But the reality is to have a really great smart home, one that's easy to use, one that's simple for the whole family, you actually need a variety of interfaces um, because depending on what you're doing at the moment, you want to interact with that phone, that home differently. If you're away from home, mobile phone is perfect. If you're scrolling through a playlist, it's perfect. But if you're walking between rooms, a keypad is far more convenient. If you're cooking and you want to turn the lights up or you want to start a playlist, voice control is ideal. And so the ability to use and control uh, your home with a variety of interfaces is really the, the kind of ideal way to set up a, a smart home. Control 4, we bring all of those together. Control 4 offers a smart home OS uh, to help orchestrate all of the products in your home, unify everything provides a variety of interfaces, and of course has a large network of certified professionals to help designers and their clients bring this to life um, within homes everywhere. So that was a quick introduction uh, uh, to Control 4. Great introduction. And it, you know, and I think it's, it's really important for us to think about the fact that uh, there is a way to connect all these devices. I don't know that it's that it's sort of a, a common understanding. You know, we tend to, as as uh, Luddites, Team Luddite over here, uh, which is why we work together. You know, I'm I'm learning. I'm getting better. But but I think it's really important that you know I'll buy what I want, 
and I'll say, oh my God, I, I love these automated shades, but I have no idea that I could be talking to somebody, at least not inherently, uh, aware of the fact that I could be talking to somebody who can help me connect the dots to make this a smooth thing. And you're absolutely right. I think now that we're in this um, environment where we're interacting with our house in a completely new way, there are so many things that are that are changing and that are here to stay. So from a, from a designer's perspective and speaking to the community that, that I'm sort of involved in on the designer side is it has to, technology has got to become an integral part of your thoughts in and around every home project. It's at the core of it, it's on top of it, it's, it's, um, it's not just home entertainment. Uh, and, uh, and I know Jamie, who we're gonna ask to show some of her favorite products right now, uh, loves to think about you know, designers and integrators starting to connect very, very early on so that they can um, start the process in the right way and not have you know, budgetary and time constraints at the end of the project. So Jamie, take it away and um, introduce us to, to some of your favorite products that designers must know about. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate the kickoff and I really appreciate that Brad mentioned to the design community at large that uh, a smart home doesn't always rely exactly on the phone all the time. That's something that is a misnomer I face in a lot of the CEU presentations they give. Um, but this isn't about that. This is about our top 10 products and solutions. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, choosing my five, having Ed choose his, that was a challenge. Uh, so I went more with kind of conceptual uh, pieces. There are a couple of, of names in here that you'll see and are familiar with, and I'll mention more, but really the concept here. Um, this was the first time that I had seen the Samsung Serif Q LED TV. Uh, it's kind of the next generation of the frame, which you may be familiar with in the design community. Um, but this is the first time I've seen the serif, which is meant to stand alone in a corner like a piece of art and then be a television when it's time to be a television. This was the first time I saw it yesterday announced at CDA Expo. So that was a really cool thing to see. Um, but really that kind of kicks off the topic of purpose-built televisions. That's really what I wanted to encompass as like my number one. You may not be aware of, and if you want to show the next slide, that'd be great. Um, you may not be aware that there are televisions built specifically to complement the interior design. Uh, this is the frame television, also by Samsung. It's a piece of art when it needs to be, and it's a television when it needs to be. Um, but there's more than just uh, a shape-shifting television with a really nice frame. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see a couple of examples here where uh, it's a purpose-built television uh, built into the vanity mirror. This is not something that was thrown together and as a science fair project. Uh, this is a purpose-built piece created by the manufacturer uh, named Sira. Um, and you can see on the left, top left, it's off. On the right uh, top, it's on. Uh, and it acts as a mirror whenever it's not there. Um, <clears throat> I recently did a project and I don't have a great finished photo to share, but uh, it was also in a bathroom where uh, the female half of the couple really wanted a full length mirror um, and the male half of the couple really wanted to watch the news. And so we blended those together in a full length custom mirror where they could do both in a, a space um, that was quite large, but there wasn't really a lot of wall space. So it worked out very well for them. Uh, one, underneath one question, Jamie, on that, just to kind of, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but on the, on the previous one that we saw, the, the art, um, it, how does that work? Is it just displaying art uh, yeah. of any choice so I can keep changing what you can. I'm looking at? Yeah, so it comes embedded with about 100 choices already from Samsung. Uh, you can pay a monthly fee and subscribe to art collections. You can also, if you have your own art or family photos, you can put those up as well, which is fantastic if you know a graphic artist to be able to have your own custom, their own custom art up on the screen. Um, the challenge with this, though, and the reason why it's important to consider, you know, collaborating early is it's not just throwing a picture on a wall, um, and it's, it's, it's a television. Uh, what you may not know or see is that there's a box about the size of an old VCR <laughs> that feeds this television information, and we need to find a spot for that box. In this particular instance, it's in that console there, but it could be located anywhere in a closet, in a media cabinet. 
uh, in it a rack. It needs to be accessible. Yeah. So it can't be just like drywall. Yeah, you don't want to see, I mean, it's, you don't really want to see it. So um, we'll hide that. <laughs> um, yeah, and so the, the other purpose-built idea or concept about hiding televisions would be through pop-up. Uh, so these lift mechanisms you can see in the bottom left uh, it was designed into a piece of cabinetry. Uh, this is a control board project, Brad, so I think you'd like that. Um, the client presses watch movie and the television pops up, his shades lower, the lights turn down, and he's able to watch whatever show he wants to watch in this area. Um, cool effect though, where, where Ed is located here, if you want to look behind Ed, uh, he actually has another purpose-built uh, television that is uh, media decor, I believe, right, Ed? Um, it's a scrolling piece of art that you'll see lift up behind Ed's head to reveal a television. Uh, similar to the frame and every other solution that I've mentioned, this is really critical to be involved early so that we have the wire in the right spot, the, the carpentry in the right spot, everything is ready to go when it's time to install this piece. And, and also right there, you're running into the first uh, issue with televisions and that's glare and that's lighting and that's all the rest of it. So suddenly it's no longer an isolated conversation about, hey, we want a TV in the mirror, but hey, we can't actually see the TV in the mirror because of how the lighting works in that room. So, so you're already having to plan it all from the get go. Absolutely. Yeah. And a, and a good integrator partner will already know that the room that you want to put a mirror television in is going to have a lot of glare. So let's talk about that at the very beginning. So we're not surprised by it at the end, you know, and, and I've actually not, I, I would love to sell mirror televisions all day long, but I've purposely not sold some in a few locations for exactly that reason. The glare was too high. It wouldn't make sense. They wouldn't be happy with the outcome. So we went with something question here from, um, from Jan Jan uh, in the audience asking how much some of those TVs are. Can you give some ballparks? Yeah, the, the frame TVs are relatively, I think they're very price competitive to any normal television that you would buy anywhere. We think the same, the, like 12 to 1300 to 2500. Um, these built in mirror televisions are going to be a little more, you know, think three, four, five thousand, depending on how big the mirror is, how big the television is. Um, and these pop-up units, the, the lift mechanism themselves, not too bad, you know, uh, kind of a cheap one, don't really like cheap lifts, but um, budget anywhere between two to 3,000 for the lift itself, plus the television, plus the speakers, plus the time to put it all in. This particular solution is a surround sound system in this bottom right two images. Mm -hmm. And so with the control, with the speakers, with everything, just the audio visual portion of that was probably around 15. So um, plus the cost of the cabinetry and whatever whatever they spent with the with the custom cabinet maker. And there's so, a there's one more option in in here, and I'm just going to kind of throw this in. There, there's no slide to speak to it, but if glare is a concern or if a larger size is is a consideration, but you still want the beauty of having it appear and disappear out of space, that's where you can move into a projection solution. So that was in in the trade we call it two piece projection, and it's a good thing to remember because there are two pieces to it. There's the screen. Um, in this case, it would be motorized. It can lift or lower depending on how you want to do it. The projector, the engine, the thing that provides the image is on the opposite end of the room. In some cases, you can put that in another room altogether and just feed the signal in. So that kind of takes it to a whole whole nother level, but you do in that scenario, you do lose the glare. Um, and so it can be a really good option um, for those kind of considerations. Um, just just a good one for you to yeah. also. Sure. I'm gonna jump in here a minute. There's a, also a third option and that is direct view LED. <clears throat> and most of those direct view LED panels have no reflection at all. And what makes them so great is that they're impervious to ambient light. Uh, and they're so bright that you can adjust the brightness to, to adapt to the environment. So that's yeah. something that's emerging, that's coming on the scene in the residential world. So, uh, and tell, tell us again, that's, that's a what? That's an LED what? Direct view LED. Um, you've but seen is it a TV, like a regular TV screen? Is that what I'm thinking? No, it's more, it's more, of, a, it's more of a monitor and actually it depends on, on who's manufacturing it. It comes in, in, in different configurations. Um, but basically what it is, is um, it's, it's a, a grouping or tethered panels of LED, smaller LED panels to create a larger footprint on a wall. Um, they're not inexpensive uh, as of now. Uh, it's some of the mo more f uh, famous ones, you know, that we're thinking of. I mean, Sony has one, Samsung, of course, has, has theirs as well, which can be upwards in the, you know, uh, multiple hundred thousands, you know, to do that. But on the commercial front, there are uh, a bunch of manufacturers 
planar comes to mind since they happen to partner in MySpace, uh, that we're seeing these pricings coming down to almost being um, attainable. Almost. We're getting there. But, <laughs> it is, but it's amazing to see how they operate in, in full light situations. Um, so uh, it's emerging technology. No, and I'm glad that you did put that in, Ed. And in fact, I think we've got some slides um, when we swing around to you. So yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I'm glad that you jumped in. Perfect. Keep doing that. Keep doing that. Yes. Well, and, and kind of the, it's the opposite concept. So one is to hide televisions and the other one would be to use it kind of as a statement piece. And, and there's a little bit of juxtaposed between some of the solutions that I picked and some of those that Ed picked. And you'll, you'll pick up on that through, throughout the course here. Um, second one that I feel is really important to mention is the connection between the automated window treatments in my world and that of the interior designer. Uh, you may already know automated treatments exist. Um, wireless, we've got an example of wireless here in the top two photos. Uh, fully wired and powered in the bottom two photos. Um, you can see that these glass walls, the embedded shades, uh, we didn't want to eat up any of the glass, any of the view. So this had to absolutely be planned during design pre-construction. There was no putting wireless after the fact or we would have lost about five or six inches of this gorgeous view. Um, but not all of them are made equal. And knowing that Roman shades are really the top category, uh, if you'll see the next slide, uh, we can actually pair um, the, the automated components, the bracketry, the motor, et cetera, with whatever fabric you as a designer would choose for a Roman shade. Uh, this example is using Hartman and Forbes, which is a handwoven fabric that is just absolutely gorgeous and I love, and I would assume the design community is familiar with this brand. Uh, we can pair this with a Lutron Roman motor and control it either through Lutron or with Control 4 so that it's an automated shade that rises and falls. You don't have a clutch uh, mechanism. You don't have to go over and fiddle with it. It can just happen throughout the day um, quietly and beautifully. Uh, this is something that a lot of, I found a lot of designers didn't know you can make an automated custom Roman shade that you can. Um, the first time I mentioned this to someone, they had just completed a project where they had 12 Roman shades in a bay window, all on a clutch mechanism. And they kind of did a, you know, smack my head mo movement and said, I wish I knew that I could have automated these because the homeowner goes around and adjusts 12 drapes or 12 Roman shades every single day, twice a day. Um, and pressing a button or having automated would have been a heck of a lot easier. So, but it's difficult um, to retrofit that, is it? Yeah. Do what now? To retrofit. So yeah. It's, it's yeah. Order. Challenging to retrofit. Yeah, these can be because uh, again, we um, losing using Lutron anyway. They require a power wire, so we we need to get wire in there um, in some way. Um, there may be battery operated Roman shades and other brands. I think Hunter Douglas might have one. Uh, for any of those wireless brands, just pay attention to the sound. You know, um, all too often we paint this beautiful picture about the shades, you know, raising to help wake you out of bed. And then someone specifies a motor, a motor specifies a motor that makes like a ton of really nasty noise. And it's not a calming way to wake up and not a calming way to go to bed. So something to pay attention to when you're looking at automated drapes is even the sound of the motor, um, because some of them can be quite loud. Uh, okay, number three, uh, linear lighting has just blown up with LEDs being a tiny little light source that you can put in a strip and put in any kind of recess or even drywalled straight into the wall. Uh, this is a project of ours that highlights that uh, using some really I can't remember how many feet of linear LED tape we used in this job, but there were a lot. Um, but the reason why I have all these pictures here together is not so much about the type of linear light. You know, yes, you can get, you know, bright, dim, it can be 3500 Kelvin or 2700 Kelvin, it can be tunable white. But really more to the point here is the fact that linear light is an option to use these days, but we need to power it with something. We need to dim it with something and those things require space and they require timing and they require coordination to make sure that everything in line works the way that it should. So here on the top left we've got uh, uh, the Lutron dimmers that are dimming and powering these linear light loads that you see both down the bowling alley and down the left side here in the game room also in the recessed lights here 
And then over on the far right is a keypad. As Brad mentioned before, that's a keypad that controls the lights in a variety of scenes. And it also can integrate with the audio video system. So entertainment mode would turn on um, the bowling alley, for instance, and some music. And uh, can also be turned off by your phone when you're comfortably in bed and your party's over with for the night. Um, but to this point here, linear lighting, if you are working in any kind of lighting capacity, having an integrator in your back pocket can certainly help make sure that you are dimming it appropriately and that you're controlling it appropriately. And all those things really need to tie together for a really great outcome. All right, <clears throat> so um, remote thermostats, you know, uh, thermostats have been made for decades and they haven't changed too much. Um, here in the top left, you'll see this X'd out box of uh, wall acne. Um, I heard a, a UK designer call it wall jewelry and I said, ooh, don't, don't use jewelry. Jewelry is way too pretty. Uh, let's call this acne because that's really what it is. Um, so we've got a picture here with a bunch of stuff. Uh, one of those happens to be a thermostat. And a lot of times these days when people think smart thermostat, they think of a brightly colored techie looking box, which yes, it can be. Um, but if you see over here, um, go ahead and click that one time, Florence. You'll see right there is a tiny little disc that's actually a remote thermostat sensor that can be painted to match the wall. Um, some of them can be uh, metal to highlight either a brush metal finish or a brass finish in the house. A much more timeless, much more classic look, something that truly just fades away. Uh, so if that, if that fades away, can I have multiple thermostats around the house to kind yes. of give myself a better distribution of, Absolutely. you know, heating and cooling? Absolutely. Yeah, depending on the system you have, sometimes they can average together. Uh, and other times, you know, maybe you want them zoned separately. I know in, in my house, I love having a cold master bedroom, but no one likes that um, in the main part of the living room. So normally that's a little more warm, but yeah. yeah, absolutely. And before we had to tie this together in, um, you know, before, before control four was around. And I remember seeing you guys come to the, one of the first CD expos I attended um, before control four around was around, we pretty much had to write an app for each home. You know, and Ed probably remembers those days of, that's basically it, you're creating it. Each home has its own operating system and you know, getting that consistent from one to another uh, can be challenging, but, um, <clears throat> but quite expensive as well. And so now with products um, like Control 4, where you can tie these together, you can have an app on your phone that you walk around with all the time. Now you can control your heating and cooling wherever you are in the world and you don't have to see it. Now the downside is you can't go up to it and adjust the, the heating and cooling, right? But in a formal area or one that's, um, that you don't want to have marred by any kind of technology, a remote thermostat sensor is a really great way to go. Okay, and the final kind of concept um, is invisible speakers. And when I first say the invisible speakers, people are like, well, what are you talking about? So I wanted to show you kind of the underbelly of what invisible speakers are. They lay in like a piece of drywall. They have transducers on the back that make that, that piece reverberate just like a speaker would. Um, they get mudded in, as you can see in the top right. Um, there are speakers in there. This left photo and the top right photo are the same ones. Um, go ahead and give a click there and you can see where these invisible speakers are actually located. And then this bottom right photo, um, you'll see I X'd out where all the light was in the center part of each of those coffers. Um, and then we also couldn't go into these other areas where chandeliers were gonna go. Go ahead and click again. <clears throat> so instead, um, if, if we would have put circles in all these other coffers, that would have looked really weird on this angle. Um, so one more click and then I'll show you where we ended up putting those invisible speakers in this particular environment, okay? Um, one note about invisible speakers, uh, typically we need some kind of subwoofer to really make them sound well. So if you as a designer are being told by your integrator, we need a spot for the subwoofer. That doesn't mean you're going to see a big ugly box, um, it, it, but it does, it will absolutely help with the sound overall um, and give it a really full rounded sound. Uh, you don't have to listen to hip hop and R&B to appreciate the low end part of music every music has a full range these days so we want to make sure to capture that um, and then finally i'll show you the result of what invisible speakers can look like in a home this was um 
this home has actually been featured a few times in this presentation. Uh, originally hired to do this house back in 2005, again, before Control 4 and other systems like that existed. Uh, they went through another renovation in 2014 where we put invisible speakers here in the ceiling. And we love this project so much that we turned it into a marketing piece, um, which you'll see on the final part of my slide. It just kind of highlights all of those areas of things you don't see and what's actually happening behind the scenes. So um, those are my top five. I can't wait to hear Ed's. I already have, you know, been given a little bit of a, a hint about what he's going to talk about. Um, and yeah, thank you. If you have any questions, I'll pop in a chat and I'll start answering those if I see them. Yeah, and Sonia just had a question here on what number two was because she missed it. And uh, this. Uh, program today is going to be recorded and remains on Cedia Expo virtual experience. So Sonia, you can come in here anytime and review the, the whole recording again. Yeah. Absolutely. What I love about Jamie's list is that it was five, but it actually was, let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It was about <laughs> nine. See, so no, but see, this is the point. When you come to Design Uncut, you get more than you bargained for. You more get more value. value for your time. <laughs> I want to travel with Jamie now because I can see how she's going to handle carry-ons and stuff like that too, ma'am. You have to, no, I got this, really. <laughs> It's going to be great. That's It'll right. <laughs> Over deliver, right? Well, it's, it's hard to whittle them down. You know, there's, there's, I can't pick five actual products. So five concepts is kind yep. of what I went for there. Yep. No, that was, that was fabulous. And believe you, if we have time, I'm going to throw some on at the end too, but, but, <laughs> but first. Yeah. And we're good because we are taking some questions in between. So if you guys are listening in today, and there's a lot of you, hi, everybody. Um, if you guys have any questions, please throw them into the Q&A, not into the chat. Uh, so that we can address them if they're relevant during the chat. If not, we'll get to them at the end of the show. There's some question about how much it costs to work with an integrator and all of that good stuff. Uh, so we can, we can tackle some of that at the end. All right, Ed, share your list with us, sir. Yeah, you know, I gave up on a list. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good, good. We break the rules around here. <laughs> but there are a couple of things I did want to talk about before we get into this video. And that is, is that everything that we've just talked about, everything that Brad spoke about, everything that Jamie's talked about relies on a robust network. And what we've seen in just the last five years is an explosion of devices within the home. So whether they're smart items that, you know, a scale, a cappuccino maker or whatever, all these things are added onto our network. Um, five or six years ago, it wasn't uncommon to have 15 devices in a home. And that was considered a pretty well populated home for, for Wi-Fi and for network devices. We're seeing now uh, lists that are going up into 100, 150 devices. So your basic consumer network isn't going to cut it in that environment. So it's really, really important that we pay attention to what's happening with the network and with the Wi-Fi to support all these devices. That also means that we have to be very, very careful, and as Jamie was pointing out, that we have to get in the early part of it. You know, we have a it's, it's kind of a nasty trend within the design world, but we're usually the last people that are consulted on the job for some reason. I think it's changing now and I think it's, it's, a, great, uh, it's a great development, but I guess because we were, have come out of the AV background, that AV was kind of an add-on, AV was kind of an afterthought. Well, that's no longer the case. We have to be considered really prior to any, uh, just uh, along the lines of the MEP development, we have to be consulted with on that. So it's super important that we get our wiring to where we need it. Wire is king still today, even though wireless is what people talk about, you need wire to actually broadcast all of that wireless activity in the home. So really want to stress that it's super important. And when it comes to that, we also get a lot of complaints from designers and architects saying, well, you know, I don't want to see that access point there. And it's gotten to the point where we say, do you want the Wi-Fi to work or not? There are certain reasons in there that why we need to locate wireless access points where we do. Now, there's a company, um, Paramount, that's uh, by our friends uh, at Wire Reboot have come out with something that you can you can actually locate that wireless access point, which can be a square or round disc. It's not really that ugly, but people do object to it. You can put it in the ceiling now, and you can have a plastic, uh, very thin uh, reveal that can be painted or can be you know, wallpapered, whatever, so it makes that somewhat invisible. So that's something that I just wanted to touch on because everything that we talk about previously and moving forward is reliant on network. Yeah. Um, but go ahead with the... Uh, 
So want to give a shout out to John Fertazzi who did the, uh, the videography on that. Yeah. He, he, he does a lot of work for integrators uh, locally and hopefully nationally soon. Um, so it brings us to a point that I did want to talk about and Jamie spoke about it and I think Brad did a little bit about tunable light and about one of the really exciting trends that's entered our market, which is really the whole wellness concept. Um, we spend 90% of our time indoors. It's, it's a very new phenomenon for human beings. Uh, we used to spend most of our time outdoors. We would only come in uh, to sleep, but we find ourselves now inside 90% of the time. And because of that, um, we are really um, uh, eliminating essential benefits of light. So we have to compensate for that. And one of the ways that we compensate with that is by using what we call human-centric lighting. This is something that's just happened because the technology has just happened. The LED lighting has just evolved to a certain point where we can actually get um, full spectrum um, lighting and, and, and it's practical. But again, that all needs to be controlled, that all needs to be planned, that all needs to be something that, you know, that, that we're talking about in the very, very beginning. Um, so we use a combination, and we'll get to that in a little bit later because I do want to talk about this, this slide that's coming up we use a combination of manufacturers to produce those results for people. And the benefits are, are you know, profound in terms of your well-being and your health. But to piggyback on the invisible speaker that Jamie was talking about, we have a different type of a speaker and that's called the small aperture speaker. Small aperture speakers are full range speakers that are concealed in walls or concealed in ceilings as well. But as a name, uh, it says it all. It's this very, very small aperture that extends in your ceiling. In this particular case, we have two examples of it, where in the left photo, you can see very, very small below the uh, picture, you can see a small square with perforations. That's actually a subwoofer. That's a gigantic subwoofer, but it's ported through this small four inch square. And in the ceilings, you can barely make them out. You can actually see some of the um, square apertures for the, for the normal uh, speakers, full range speakers that are in that ceiling. To the right, you can see what we did, but in this case, we had a template cut into that ribbed woodwork that you're seeing in the ceilings. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that, and this is a James loudspeaker product, the small aperture. They provided us with the template. The woodworker actually drilled this into that composite wood that you're looking at, which is a composite of, I think it was, I wanna say it's pear wood and cherry wood that, um, that they combined to create this effect. When you, if you go back to that next slide, uh, the previous slide, if you take a look at that in the ceiling, it, it's, it's unnoticeable. You don't even know it's there. And it's, it's pretty remarkable in terms of the, the sound level. It's a high performance uh, speaker. We have invisible speakers in our showroom but um, we, we find that we use that more for, for um, uh, background music or for sound masking when we have events. Um, and um, certainly over the years, and I've been around long enough where I've seen the very first iteration of invisible speakers all the way till now, it's been amazing in terms of the progress that's been made and we're about to see some more shortly. But these small aperture speakers give us the um, 
a distinct advantage when a, when a client really is looking for a high performance solution and making it as visible as possible. I will say one thing about this. Small aperture speakers typically need to be aligned within the lighting grid and you have much more flexibility and freedom with invisible speakers. They're not tethered to any grid and that, that's from a design standpoint can be really advantageous. What about the sound quality? Does it uh, suffer from when you hide the speakers in this way? No, not at all. You're talking about the small apertures? Yeah. Yeah, not at all. And not at all. In fact, this is uh, this template was provided by James Speakers with, with their bless with their engineering team saying this will work. And it sure does. I mean that that studio, which is also another example in a way of the wellness initiative that we were talking about, because it is a yoga studio. Um, you know, the, the idea of the serenity of that space, of, of how, you know, the whole impact. We didn't want to see speakers, you know, uh, you know really uh, imposing themselves in that environment at all. And I think, you know, especially from the integration side, but, you know, that, that intersection, that space really is wellness applied to me. And I think, you know, just kind of speaking to the integration community for the last year, year plus, where we've been really trying to figure out what, what to do with wellness and how to present it um, and, how, and how our skill set would cater to those environments. This yoga studio is a perfect example of that, but I think also with a very deep rooted design focus on it as well and, and how you've perforated the wood to create the environment for the speakers and design there are you can cover speakers in other manners you can you can put other materials over them to complement or accentuate the space that's a conversation for another day and with those you do want to be really careful with the speaker selection that's why having a relationship with the integrator is important to understand what's possible but then to also make that dream a reality so um, yeah and really one, it, it, that yoga studio is just spectacular it's, it's incredible yeah it makes me want to do yoga and I just try to stay away from that stuff but it's <laughs> It's really, really cool. And, and we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanna make sure that everybody knows we will have follow-up conversations. Again, you can find Design on Cut on the Facebook group. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash KBI group. Sign up there, hop on in. Uh, we'll, you're, you're more than welcome to join the conversation there and we will have deep dives on a number of these topics in the future. So, sorry. So I'm gonna kind of fast forward on this. Um, this is a project that we, we, where we got brought in at a very late stage in the design and the chandelier had already been selected and it was non-negotiable, it was staying. But the client, the husband, really wanted a projection system in this room. And he had gone through a couple of integrators and I, they said, there's no way to do this. So what we ended up doing was convincing the architect to actually extend this off it, as you can see along the uh, brick wall. Uh, and within that soffit, we located, uh, actually it was beneficial in the sense that we were able to do str a linear lighting behind it to kind of illuminate the brick, which was fun. And then of course the screen drops there. But as you can see, we had to use a scissor lift, which we almost, we don't particularly like using it, but we're finding ourselves in another project where we have to do it again, uh, just to drop that four feet so that it can project. So between Stuart screens, giving us the extra black drop on the top that we needed, and as well as getting a four foot drop on that scissor list for the projector, it was a little difficult. But you can see in the, between the left and the right, how it really does mostly disappear into that ceiling. Um, moving on, so this is an example we're talking about, direct view LED. This is a, a, an enormous uh, uh, direct view LED. It's cr created a window, basically, effect. And then using customized uh, art uh, and also uh, audio, um, it, if you can go to the website for Light Walls, I think it's lightwalls.uk.co, um, you can actually see the video of this, which is amazing. Um, this is the type of immersive experience that can really transform a space in a very, very different way because you can change it literally with the press of a button, going back to the whole control feature and everything that we're talking about. And, um, so there are different examples of this. In our showroom, we have a lot of video displays from Planar. It doesn't really matter what the display is. It's the concept that's really important and that you can display either just static video art or moving video, which is really very, very stunning. And, and in certain uh, situations, and uh, I'm gonna speak very quickly here, this started probably, the idea of this started for me about seven years ago when I was asked to do a commercial project in a room that had no windows at all. And the client wanted, to feel like 
can we create something? So we did with very large uh, LED televisions, put them in, in portrait mode, and we put mullions around them so they look like windows. And then we were able to transport anybody to Paris or to London or to New York or Central Park or a live video feed of Hudson River, which was kind of cool. People would walk in and just be completely disoriented. But it's really, I'm hearing you say the word commercial a, a couple of times now. So commercial design really more and more informs residential design when it comes to tech, doesn't it? Yeah, there's been a lot of crossover. Um, you know, we were talking years ago, people would talk about IT and AV and how is that working? And now we see now that we have AV over I, you know, IP solutions. And we're seeing a lot of ideas getting transferred from the commercial world into the residential world. Uh, it's, it's, it's a unique synergy that's beginning to happen. And I, 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 I love it. This is another example. This is a different art form, but within the same room that we were just looking at. So you can see how you completely change the environment. And that's the key of this. Another way of doing this is with projection. And from our friends from Barco and using um, um, a subscription-based art service like Neo, um, whether it's Neo or Black Dove, you can, you, uh, you can actually purchase these subscriptions and you can look at art. And we love, you know, the, the idea actually of immersive art and changing your environment was something that um, Barco has been talking about for a long time. The great thing with Barco is that you can actually not, you don't need that projector to be centered um, on, uh, on any type of uh, viewing uh, surface. You can put this all the way in the corner of a room. You can hide it using uh, display technologies, mirror technology, where it can just drop out of the ceiling with a mirror. That's all you're seeing. You're seeing the whole, like in the picture we showed, the whole projector dropping. Just have a little mirror uh, that comes down and full picture and completely off access. So this is a really cool idea using traditional projection. Um, and the next slide is going to show um, what we took. In a, in a much scaled down version. And Brad, I want to thank everybody at Snap AV because they stepped up and actually sponsored this project for J Bespoke, which is a sports bar that had the unfortunate opening right before COVID. Uh, but good news is they're reopening again, which is great. Um, here we have uh, some planar LEDs, typical LED monitors, but projection in the front. Um, and they're using Black Dove here to actually get the art. The idea is that if it's a sports bar when, when the, the game isn't on or games, multiple games aren't on, they can just have art and music playing. Um, and it's created a really dramatic effect uh, with that project. So we really um, appreciate that. Well, welcome to my showroom. This is my showroom where we have example of layered lighting, where we have both um, tunable lighting, recessed lighting, as well as accent lighting. In this case, it's color beam doing all that access lighting and also the strip lighting that's down below. But what I wanted to also show you was the third way that we were just talking about to conceal um, AV components, and that's using fabric and acoustical treatments. We think that acoustics are really important and something that typically get talked about in dedicated theaters, but should really be spoken about in every room. Acoustics is part of the whole wellness initiative as well and controlling sound and, and, and uh, it, it, it's amazing how it affects the nervous system. And, and uh, it's something that we just from a conversational standpoint had to address in every single room in our showroom. Um, so whether it was an idea of putting a clipso material, an opaque clipso material on the ceiling with batting behind it to create absorption, which we did in several rooms, or whether it was using that same clipso material to, to actually transmit light from behind it and also uh, audio and, and speakers behind it, we utilize that. But in this particular case, and if we can slip to the next uh, slide, um, sorry, one more, uh, this picture, what you're looking at is a huge direct view LED. It's a 165 inch LED um, uh, screen that's there. Um, but what you don't know is if I'm looking at it and it's very hard in person when you go right up to it is to know that it's, we had, it's sitting on the wall, it's not in the wall. So it's four inches. And what we did was we beveled that material to come out from the bottom where it matches the um, um, uh, baseboard and it gently slopes up to meet that. So it was a very clever way of, of dealing with. And the reason why we did that was because this panel has actually changed four times in four years. So how can you adapt that? And that leads me you know, to this uh, topic about using fabric actually. So forget about the, the beautiful Meridian uh, speakers that are this, in that. This room actually has a 7.4.4 Dolby Atmos speaker system. So it's 11 speakers all behind the fabric panels. 
And in this case, we're using whisper wool, which is a way that if I decide in a year that I really don't want to use that fabric, I want to change it up, it's very easy for me to change. I can just simply pull that fabric out, stretch new fabric in, install it, and you're there. Or an idea that's happening, putting light walls in that uh, to accent you know, uh, those panels. That's something that's definitely on tap for us. So we wanted, you know, we want designers to understand that fabric can be your friend in, in terms of both treating the acoustic properties of the room, but more importantly, hiding super high performance audio where it doesn't have to be standing out front as you're seeing the Meridians or in the previous picture of the Steinway Lindorf Model Ds, which are statement pieces in their own right. But a lot of people like that hidden, they want it clean. This is how you can accomplish that using traditional fabrics, but with a newer form uh, to actually secure that fabric to the wall, which is using plastic tracks and actually just compression fitting the fabric in. Wow. That was, I, that was a lot of material. I'm sorry, but I had that to, was no, but that's no what apologies. we want. <laughs> we definitely want to have a lot of material, and you know, there there is so much to think about. But I think the the bottom line to recap, you know, thinking about getting in touch with integrators well ahead of the project to plan this out right uh, is important, and thinking about either hiding or featuring. Um, elements like audio and like your your video display is is a great great way. One of the questions I wanted to kind of uh, I know we have to go here in a minute or two uh, for Brad though uh, Control Four is a brand with many products in a variety of categories as well. Uh, why is it important to view things, especially why is it important to view things in this manner, um, uh, especially for designers? What do, what do designers have to kind of really think about in terms of all the components that go into that control for can connect? Well, I think just as, as both Ed and Jamie have spoken about, um, lean on your professionals. Um, the, they've done projects. They've, they've worked with a wide variety of products. Um, they can be your guide as you go through that. I think that's, you know, one of the most important elements. The second is, um, as you talk to your clients, Talk about and think about the lifestyle they want to achieve rather than just speaking about tech all the time. How do they want to spend their evenings? How do they want to spend their work day? How do they want to spend time with family? You know, uncover those kinds of uh, insights about the, the client and that will naturally lead you to the right pieces of technology and the right things, right? Just like Ed talked about statement speakers versus the invisible speakers, right? And, and that comes down to a lifestyle choice. Yes, yeah, statement, I want to show off this beautiful technology, these beautiful, incredible speakers versus I just want to hear music and I don't want to see it. I want to see art instead. So I think that's the second piece. Find a pro and then focus on the lifestyle, not necessarily the individual pieces of technology. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very well said. And, and we've obviously here today, we've covered some brands. We've kind of co also covered uh, categories or, or types of, of groupings of products. So what I'll add to that is that while you have been presented brands here today, try not to get overly hung up on the brands because what you'll find is that different integrators work with and specialize in different brands. It doesn't mean that, this, that a similar experience can't be achieved, but once you start getting really kind of honing in on those brands, you may find that it's, that it's a difficult conversation to get back out of once you've identified your technology professional in that if it's not one that they're familiar with, they're not really going to want to jump in and, and learn um, and use your client as a guinea pig. There is a, there is a place and a time for that scenario. You know your clientele, whether that's something they want to be a, you know, on the bleeding edge um, of, of that technology or not. But that's, again, the relationship with the technology pro really is where, where you want to focus your attention and make sure that you've got a good working relationship. And not, maybe it's not just with one. There are, you know, again, they all specialize in different areas. So you may find that having a grouping of integration pros in your camp is, is a great thing. You'll know once you start having these relationships, which brings me to my, one of my closing points there are resources available to you to identify integration pros. Uh, this is the CEDIA Expo Show. CEDIA is an acronym, the Custom Electronic Design and Installation Association. If you find the website, you will find that there are integration um, professional recommendations there based on your geography or the geography of, of the project. There also is another association out there, the Home Technology Association. They too have an integrator finder. Oftentimes you can take a look at both of them, get to know what, and, and do some interviewing, see which ones work best for you.
The Home Technology Association also provides you a technology budget calculator. You'll find those on Ed and Jamie's websites when you go and tour those. It's a great starting place to have the conversation about what all this technology that clients are looking for should cost. And it, it, it reduces the, the time and friction. So a couple of options there for you. This has been a fabulous session. I'd like to thank Jamie Briesmeister, Ed Gilmore, Brad Hinsey, Control for our sponsor. You guys have been fantastic today. Veronica, you want to close this out and bring us home? No, I have nothing to say. I think you need to be one of those car loan kind of people. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you guys so much for joining. Thank everybody in the audience today. I put in the, uh, in the chat here today where you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash groups, KBI group, and know that this recording right here will live on Cedia Expo virtual experience until the end of the year. So come back and check it out. Thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you everybody.